Richmond and a few people from Lansing online. Um, but, um, you know, I, I really appreciated the work that Pat Everett did in, in organizing both, you know, Concord humanists and uh, humanist outreach uh, around the country. And I hope we can continue in that tradition. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna share a screen if I may. And oops, you, I can't share screen at the moment. So Andy, you'll have to give me permission. Okay, looks good. So let's go here. And okay, so all right, can you all see the screen? Great, okay. So I'd like to talk with you today about, in some sense, one of my, my favorite humane humanist talks. Of, and the reason for that is that I think, although I'm, I'm very proud of many aspects of our humanist tradition, I think we have achieved some things at quite a cost. And part of that cost is alienation from the broader stream of, of life and how animals think and feel and how our ancestors may have thought and felt. And I like to think that if we understand more about sort of the, the kinds of creatures with whom we share the world, um, we might understand both uh, more about our own lived experience, um, and we might get some sense of what we might expect if we ever do meet the extraterrestrials who really should be out there. Um, they haven't shown up, or at least not that we really have any evidence of, but at some point I expect if humanity survives, we will be meeting other intelligent species. Uh, what, you know, are they gonna be like us? Well, we'll see. I think there's also an ethical uh, aspect to this that has come to the fore more in the last 50 years. Um, most of us, you know, feel some bonding with some domestic animals, particularly our pets, but a lot of peoples don't. Um, if we feel empathy for animals suffering, do we owe them something? And, you know, how much should our feeling of connection carry philosophical or ethical weight? You know, have I, if I, we just, we just talked about cats. A lot of pet owners say, well, I know exactly how my dog or cat or what have you feels. How much weight should that really carry? So those are some of the questions we'll start to get into tonight. I think there's a lot more to be done. Uh, there's a lot more that's not known. So I'm gonna sort of do this in, in uh, roughly two stages. Uh, so the first stage I'm gonna be, you know, introducing things. I'm gonna be talking about things you might broadly call thinking. So tool use, planning, memory, you know, the things that get, get things done in the world. And then I'll pause uh, for five or 10 minutes to, to answer questions or to have discussion. And then I want to come back and talk about feeling social sociability and then address, you know, pets and empathy. And then wrap up in terms of, of what implications we might draw for now. And for those of you who want to explore further, I've got some, some other resources. So let's get started and dive into sort of some philosophical issues, um, conceptual issues maybe be a better word. So first of all, when we talk about animals having a mind, we kind of phrase that question as though it's yes or no. You know, does my cat have a mind? Um, and we get, you know, we get into arguments, you know, some cat lovers will say, yes, of course, how dare you say otherwise? Uh, and, you know, perhaps more skeptical uh, people or dog lovers <laughs> will say no, <laughs> they're, they're just little robots. And I think, I think that's the wrong question. I think it's a good opening question, but it's a bad closing question. Um, we should be thinking more in terms of degree of minds or even kinds of minds. 
uh, rather than, you know, does this animal have a mind? Is this animal conscious? Does this animal have subjective experience? I think there's a lot of gradations there. It's a lot of different kinds of, of minds. And I think that's partly due to the fact that different kinds of animals have evolved to address different kinds of problems in their life world. Um, here are pictures of just some mammal brains. I haven't even shown any of the bird brains or the octopus brain, um, but uh, just among mammals, you can see there's a substantial difference just superficially in shape and size. And these differences are actually meaningful. Um, uh, dolphins have a very much enlarged parietal cortex. Now, as far as we know, in terms of human beings, parietal cortex is very important for sort of three-dimensional spatial relationships. Um, so if you're an animal that's sort of navigating in three dimensions, you know, most of us navigate in two dimensions. We can look up and down, but basically, you know, we're pretty much fixed to, to, to moving in two dimensions. But dolphins really have to move in three dimensions. So maybe it makes sense that they have exquisite uh, capacity for geometry, you know, three-dimensional geometry. If, you know, if they could do anything abstract with it, we don't know, but they can certainly place themselves and bounce objects with, with fantastic precision that you know, our best basketball players would envy. On the other hand, uh, here's an elephant brain. It's actually quite a bit bigger than ours, although that's a little bit misleading. The cells are also quite a bit bigger. So um, it actually doesn't have as many cells um, in the forebrain as we do. Um, but you may notice that there's this big extension here. That's the temporal lobe. Um, and that's important for object recognition and for memory. You've heard the maxim, elephant, an elephant never forgets. That really seems to be true. Um, and uh, they have uh, excellent memory and um, that seems to be related to their brain structure. I won't go into some of these others, but they're, you know, most of these other animals will have much more of their brain devoted to say smell, particularly your dog will have um, you know, a large portion or much larger portion of its brain devoted to making fine distinctions among different smells. So let's start with the thing that has always compelled us to think of animals having minds. We, we used to think that we were the only creature that used tools and that was a signature of our intelligence. Of course, you know, 200 years ago, it was a signature of our God-given intelligence. Now we don't think that way, but we still think that tool use is what sets us apart. And to a large extent, that's true, but it's become clear that actually many animals use tools. And the ones that sort of made headlines, uh, gosh, this was 60 years ago, not quite 60 years ago, when Jane Goodall first reported that chimpanzees uh, could use tools. Um, she reported them fishing for termites with sticks um, uh, as they're doing here. So they would break off and then trim a twig um, and then uh, insert it into places where they might find bugs. Uh, and in the, you know, the uh, 50 years since Jane Goodall's discovery, we found that many different groups of chimps uh, use, in some cases, quite different toolkits. So here's a, um, a uh, chimp using a rock, uh, but uh, it's a hammer stone and cracking nuts on, cracking these, I'm not sure what kind of nuts those are, but hopefully they're good tasting, uh, on an anvil. And we have found that in fact, um, several other apes do that. Um, and we'll, um, we have actually found um, tool middens, you know, garbage heaps of some of the um, capuchin monkeys that have been dated to uh, over 500 years old. So these capuchins have been using tools for many centuries and probably many millennia. Um, I noticed a couple of questions and I'll, I will pause for questions in a little bit. So please hold on to them. Don't, um, they're not forgotten. So, um, so definitely chimps use tools, um, but other 
uh, animals use tools. So the capuchins, so capuchin monkeys are in uh, the Americas as opposed to chimps in, um, in Africa. And uh, they have completely independently evolved tool use as far as we can tell. And they use uh, slightly different stones to open somewhat different nuts, Brazil nuts and other nice nuts that they like to eat that have very hard shells. Uh, but it's not limited to primates. So uh, we've noted, for example, that sea otters will use rocks and they'll often carry a rock with them, sort of like they have a pouch. <laughs> and they'll carry their favorite rock with them because good rocks are hard to find on the sea, sea bottom. Uh, so if they, gotta get if they have a good rock, they'll carry it for a while and use it to crack open um, clams or other mollusks that they're trying to, um, trying to eat. And uh, a number of other animals have used rocks. Some birds use, um, uh, so other animals use rocks to, to open nuts. Some birds have used the opposite strategy. So instead of bringing something hard down fast on the nut, they have brought the nut down fast on something hard. Um, so they, and many birds around the world will drop, will grab a nut, fly up quite high, and drop it on some rocky outcrop. Um, what's really intriguing is the crows in Sapporo um, who have figured out that if they drop the nuts on a heavily trafficked roadway where there's a lot of traffic, um, then the cars will do their work for them, crush the nuts, uh, and uh, then they wait until so Japan's a very orderly society. So, you know, when the crosswalk light is on, um, the, uh, the cars really do stop. And the crows have learned this and they rush out when the crosswalk light turns and gather up all their crushed nuts. It's hilarious to watch. <laughs> um, you, tools can go a little, bit, um, a little bit further into the dark side, if you will. Um, so uh, here's a chimp with a, well, it's tempting to call it a spear. It's a sharpened digging stick. Um, it's not, it's, you know, you don't think of a, an army of chimps marching on your town with shields and spears. No, this is not that kind of spear. This is the kind of spear you would use to spear small an prey animals in holes. And it's, it's a little bit sad because they like to spear bush babies who are rather appealing and cute, uh, but apparently also very tasty. Um, and this is largely, interestingly, this is a relatively, we think it's a relatively recent invention. We don't know, um, but it hasn't been widely documented. It's certainly not known outside this group in, in Senegal. Um, and it seems to be mostly um, uh, done by uh, younger males and adolescent females. So uh, not to, you know, they're not gonna be marching on your town soon but they are you know, definitely uh, a bit dangerous for bush babies. And again, they're not the only animal that makes spears. Um, the uh, Caledonian crows are famous for manufacturing spears quite sim you know, again, a similar idea. They'll take, in this case, they'll take um, a uh, stem from a, uh, I think it's a, I'm not sure if that's a pandanus or something, anyway, it's another, a big leaf with a very tough stem. And they'll trim off all the, the, the leaf part and uh, sharpen the end uh, and they'll get a, um, a tool that's quite good for digging in to holes. So all of those three holes in the, the wood there and that fallen tree trunk have been dug by insects uh, and they have very big fat grubs in them and the grubs are quite tasty and the crows will spend hours making these tools and they'll keep them. Again, they, they have their favorite stashes of tools. They don't, they don't just discard them, but they'll spend several hours making it, but then they only need you know, a few minutes to, to get their lunch. It's a very effective, uh, very effective. And, and a couple of grubs is a pretty big meal. Um, now, the crows that we see every day um, don't do this spontaneously, at least we've never observed it. Uh, but uh, if you give them them fixings and a motivation, they'll learn quite quickly to make uh, tools themselves and even to bend hooks. Uh, and then they will uh, you know, use them very dexterously. So it's certainly within their range. 
um, it's for whatever reason, not something they need to do on a daily basis. So uh, certainly there's evidence of then tool use uh, as a very crude index of, of thinking ability. Uh, but there's also evidence, for example, of memory. So uh, let's sort of do it the other way around, start with birds this time. Um, the uh, scrub jays in the southwestern United States are famous for uh, spending you know, many long days during the summer gathering uh, pine nuts and other seeds. They have a very large range and then uh, hiding them away like squirrels do but they're not hiding them in your backyard. They're hiding them over their whole range, you know, which could be a hundred square miles. Um, and um, so they put a lot of effort into it and then they retrieve them in the winter. And we, we, of course, we don't know exactly how many, but they seem to retrieve more than half of them. Um, so, you know, it's a good investment on their part uh, and a lot of work. And it only works because they have a fantastic spatial memory. If you could remember the location of, you know, 10,000 individual items over 100 square miles of bush, <clears throat> that's impressive. Um, and of course, um, you know, we can test them and uh, people um, like Nicola Clayton in Great Britain have tested their, uh, their accuracy and they, at least in the lab, they can act, recall at least a thousand distinct locations. So it seems very possible that in their home range, they could recall, you know, up to 10,000 of them. So there, again, quite impressive feats of memory. And of course, there's our favorite uh, example of, of, of um, memory. And it's not simply folklore. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of evidence of them, you know, of course they can recognize other individual elephants and communicate quite effectively, quite specifically to other elephants. They can also recognize individuals. They can, you know, if a person has been friendly to them, they'll recognize, they'll remember that person. If a person's been un, uh, unpleasant to them, they'll remember that person as well and react differently. Um, but perhaps most compellingly, um, you know, elephants live in, in a, an area that suffers from, you know, varying degrees of drought and some of the droughts can be very severe. Uh, and uh, there's, you know, they typically during the dry season go to water holes, perennial water holes, but sometimes in a period of very severe drought, even, even the water hole that's been reliable for the last 50 years may dry up. So what do you do? Um, and it seems, uh, it's been observed many times that uh, the older matriarchs, and, and this is, you know, elephants really do have a a very hierarchical society. Um, and the elephant matriarchs can recall and will lead the troop to a watering hole that they may not have visited since the last big drought, which could have been 30, 40, 50 years ago uh, when they were very young. Somehow they, they remember how to get there. It's a long walk. <laughs> you know, elephants, yeah, can cover a fair bit of ground in a hurry, but this is still several days. On, on difficult land. So they certainly can remember. What about planning? We like to think of planning as sort of the hallmark of intelligence or in, at least anticipation. Um, and this has been historically a little harder to demonstrate, but in the last 10 years, there's been a number of really good demonstrations of how much animals plan. I'm not gonna give you a comprehensive survey. Um, but um, again, particularly with birds, just because they're a little easier to work with. Um, you know, I mentioned that crows, common crows, will fabricate their own tools. So if you give, you know, if the experimenter gives them a wire and a food that needs a hook to grab it, then they will bend the wire to make the hook. Uh, and it doesn't seem to require any trial and error. They, they seem to go for it pretty, pretty readily. Um, there's even some sort of social planning. So I mentioned the scrub jays and that they cache food. Uh, but of course, scrub jays are you know, not saints. They're very much like us. 
maybe uh, us on a bad day. Uh, so if um, they do steal from each other, and uh, so if another bird is watching, of course, you know, why should that bird go to the trouble of finding its own food if it can steal somebody else's food? Um, so, um, uh, you know, if another bird is watching them, then um, they'll often, you know, fly, catch the food, fly away, wait 10 minutes, come back, and then hide the food again somewhere else. Uh, so they're, they're quite clearly able to, to at least anticipate that uh, another bird watching them is, it might, you know, might be resulting in their food being gone. Um, we have other kinds of sort of indirect evidence. Again, Crows, Nicola uh, Clayton did this study where, um, you know, she would put crows in a situation where they, you know, would get either one or other of, uh, of their foods. And she knew that they, they liked novelty, but she would give them an opportunity to, to cache food, to, to select food, to take back home, to take back to their home cage. Um, during the daytime, and then in the morning, you know, in the morning she'd only give them one food, and they would figure they would learn quickly which food they would get. And what they would do is they'd selectively uh, uh, cache, or they would selectively pick out the food that they weren't going to get, and store it in their home cage overnight. And then uh, in the morning they would have both kinds of food available to them. Uh, and of course, if she switched which food was going to be provided, then they would switch which food they, they prepared for and packed away. So they were, they were quite capable of, of anticipating, you know, what life would be like for them in the morning. Uh, something that sometimes we, we struggle to do. Um, and of course, coming back to chimpanzees, um, they are capable of good deal of organized behavior. Um, not all of it very pleasant or salubrious, so uh, they do hunt small animals, um, small deer and uh, monkeys in the trees, and they anticipate where the prey is likely to break and they will uh, organize themselves, typically a group of four or five or six male chimps will uh, place themselves at you know, the likely escape routes and then one, the driver, will you know, make a big noise and rush at the animal and drive the animal into the arms of one of the other waiting chimps, and then they will all share, and they'll all tear the animal apart and eat it. Uh, not very pleasant, but that is a, certainly an example of planning. Um, they also seem to be able to plan their wars. Uh, they, they sort of gather together and organize certain kinds of patrols. Um, not exactly a pleasant aspect of, of our nature either but it certainly shows their capacity for planning. So I think there were a number of questions in the chat and I think um, Lydia had a question. So why don't I invite Lydia to start? And um, um, then let's, uh, let's go. Oh, Lydia lost audio, okay. Um, so who has a question then? Do you want to just put up your hand or come on? You may have to start your video. Oh, um, have I started my video? No, I have. Oh, you're fine. I'm just saying some people have their videos off. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if you have a question, just start your video and unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi. Sure, go ahead, Steve. Um, what I, my impression is that the animals that are more intelligent, the mammals tend to have like an extended childhood and a lot of social interaction. Uh, and uh, I think you can argue that for birds too, they're, the smarter ones are very social. Then on the other extreme uh, is the octopus, which is entirely alone but they are smart enough that they can they can solve puzzles you can have a puzzle box with a crab in it and they can figure it out so their their intelligence has a very different basis so i'd be interested to hear um, 
anything that that you have to say about that? Yes, Steve. That uh, I do have just a short, uh, you know, one slide on octopus brains. It's it's still very, you know, it's it's just just last year someone succeeded in recording the activity of a single neuron in an octopus brain for the first time. So we don't know very much about what's going on in the brains of octopods. Uh, you're quite right that generally speaking with uh, mammals and birds, uh, the intelligence seems to be related to sociability. Um, there's also a, a, a correlate with environmental variability and opportunity uh, at least in birds, we can say that it seems to be that the social learning comes first and that birds who have <clears throat> sort of become smart to deal with their social environments then sort of go on to, to, to expand into more difficult and more complicated uh, um, environments of, uh, you know, food environments, hunting and, and gathering environments. Um, we don't have enough data yet on primates to be sure which, which comes first, but that's, it, we suspect it's the same story. Um, the, um, the octopus is really a conundrum. Um, they are, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, perhaps you can come back to that question after the second half. Sure. We're talking about that. Um, I, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. So you spoke about making tools and very specific tools used by chimpanzees and and I have watched the the crows in Japan it's really quite incredibly fascinating um, but do you see in in evaluating the ability to make a tool do you see um, that they are all doing the same thing or and therefore that's the indicator that they can make tools or do you see whether it's chimpanzees or crows or anyone else, adaptive behavior that the skill, the functionality to make a tool is there and that they all create different tools depending upon their environment? Um, so, uh, you know, Emma, that is a very active research question. I would be pretentious if I gave you a simple answer to that. That's a question that's exercising some of our best animal researchers right now. Um, and at least as far as I can tell from, from reading what other people are doing, and we're hoping to do some experiments like that soon ourselves, but as far as I can tell, um, it seems to be a, a bit of both and the proportions of both seem to vary depending on which animal you're talking about. So some animals seem to have fairly, you know, a few very smooth, very well executed moves that they can combine in different ways, but they can't really adapt them. You know, they can't make up too many new things. And others seem to have a sort of more general toolkit uh, that they can put to a variety of different uses. Um, and um, so it, it seems to vary. Uh, there was a, a research study that um, I just read about this morning, where it turned out that even ants, you know, you think of ants being about as close to a little robot as, as we can get, even ants actually seem to learn from each other. And if they don't have social contact with other ants modeling the kinds of behaviors that they are supposed to do, um, they, they won't do them at the appropriate times as well. They, they'll still have, they still have the same repertoire. It's very you know, they'll execute their behaviors very smoothly, but they'll be kind of missing the triggers. Mm. So that's perhaps one extreme. And then at the other extreme, you've got you know, animals like primates or monkeys or, or apes with a lot of dexterity that they can turn to a variety of different uses. Um, so we're still trying to figure out the great range and where crows are on that. <laughs> I don't know, but we're th that's a hard question. Any other questions? There's one in the chat from Kyle about Portia spiders. So this is um, this is something that um, is somewhat controversial, but I think the weight of opinion among animal behaviorists is that the 
a lot of insect behavior and arachnid behavior is, is you know, again, closer to like ant behavior. There's, they have a few really smooth moves that are, are, as far as we can tell, hardwired into their brains and they, have, they can adapt the cues for them. And in spiders, it seems to be the, you know, the adaptation of the web. Um, that's not, you know, 100% sure, but that's the, that's the dominant opinion right now, the weight of opinion. Um, you know, if we can actually see these spiders, you know, adapting in a in sort of engineering fashion to different stresses and structures, then um, we might have more, you might have more of a case for general intelligence. Okay. Is, is there uh, any evidence that animals similar to us, like chimpanzees, are still evolving? Or is that something that takes place over such a long time you can't quite pick it up? Are, is oh boy, there you got into a can of worms. Uh, so yeah. so as, a, as a general rule of thumb, I think we should assume that all animals are still evolving. Um, you know, the, the, I think the consensus about an evolutionary theory is that there are periods of very rapid, you know, selection, different selection away from, you know, the current environment, you know, when animals either get into a new environment or encounter a new predator or encounter a new disease. Uh, even on our genomes, there are signatures of very rapid evolutionary adaptation in the last 10,000 years to uh, certainly to, to plagues and diseases. Uh, actually, I'll actually be talking about this for the Teacher Institute of Evolutionary Sciences in a couple of weeks. Um, and then there's evidence of adaptation to, to sort of psychological social pressures that, um, and, and that's more like in the last you know, 30 or 40,000 years. Uh, so, so there's certainly, you know, periods of rapid evolution. Uh, and then there are periods of sort of slower evolution when it seems like, at least superficially, nothing much changes. But the genome is sort of, you know, gradually changing underneath, <clears throat> um, but not in any particular direction as far as, as, far as we can tell. Um, so, so all animals have, have been, you know, are continually evolving. The last thousand years have been a period of unprecedented environmental stress for most animals. And that environmental stress has been us. Um, we've basically pushed them out of a lot of the best land. Uh, we have created, um, you know, these, these uh, massive food heaps called farms that animals either learn to exploit or learn to avoid. And we have created this, these dense concentrations of nutrients called garbage that um, seagulls and uh, rats and some other very adaptive intelligent animals have become focused on. And, and even some other, you know, it's happened in baboon troops that, you know, if a tourist hotel goes up, uh, the baboons learn very quickly that they can get a free meal. And you know, the, the, what's thrown out by the luxury hotels is often quite nutritious. <laughs> um, the drawback is that it's often got diseases in it too. Um, and Robert Sapolsky has a very interesting story about that, which I'll uh, I'll let you look up. But um, the uh, yeah, so so animals are are always evolving, and they are under rapid, you know, under very strong selective pressure right now to get along with us to co-evolve with us. And in fact, we can sh it's been shown that many city dwelling animals are undergoing extraordinarily rapid evolution. That um, they're becoming bolder, they're getting better digestion because they have to eat a lot of, gar they're eating a lot of garbage. Um, so they're, they're, they're having much more, you know, effective digestion and, and much less stomach upset. Um, they're learning to sort of tune out the noise in their environment. Um, so they're becoming in some sense less sensitive to their environment. They're becoming a lot more aggressive. Um, so this is, you know, this is evolution at work. 
it's not necessarily, I, I don't know that I would feel very good about any of those things I've just told you, uh, but that's the kind of selective pressure that um, most animals are under right now. Uh, so chimpanzees are also evolving. We don't really have very much in the way of historical chimp genomes. Uh, it's just in the last you know, 10 years that we've been able to get historical human genomes. Um, and have been able to see directly how humans have been evolving. Um, we, the, the genomes, you know, don't preserve very well in Africa. Uh, so we don't have any, you know, chimpanzee genomes from a uh, thousand years ago or 10,000 years ago. So we don't know quite how they've been evolving, but there's, uh, um, I think there's good reason to think that they have been evolving, but we, we as of yet can't specify which directions. And certainly some of, you know, these spears, the spears I mentioned seem to be relatively new. They were, they were not observed even in that area previously by the indigenous people, at least the ones who have been in, interviewed. There's a lot missing in our, in our records. So um, I think it's fair to say that we don't really know, but it, it seems to be a new behavior. So it's possibly something that that they've evolved in. I'm getting some, um, you know, a tangential question, could the chimps or even dolphins be the sentient aware beings of tomorrow? Uh, that's a bigger question. I, I'd love to answer that, but maybe at the end. Um, and, uh, oh yes, there's some, um, yeah, well, let's, um, bubble net feeding is a good example of a, a sort of cultural behavior. And I'll come to those in just a minute. Um, and is there evidence of kindness or spitefulness? Oh boy. Uh, yes, there's plenty of evidence of both. Um, and does communication between animals come in the scope of kindness and communication I will be getting to. Uh, so why don't I get along to um, the next half of the talk? Uh, okay, so let me share screen again. And here we are. Okay. Um, oops, let's go on. All right, so I want to come to now the sort of feeling and sociable aspect of, of animal behavior or animal minds. And um, uh, so that, I think that'll address some of the questions in the chat, but, but there'll be some time to talk afterward. So um, I'm going to start by, uh, <laughs> I, I find this picture quite heartwarming. Uh, this rat is having a very good time. <laughs> Usually when you pick up rats, they hate it. Uh, you know, as we would hate if being picked up by the Jolly Green Giant or by H.G. Wells, you know, 100 foot high Martians. Um, but um, it's certainly, um, if, you, if, you, if you are a careful observer of animals and you're empathic, um, as a Yak Panksep who really really discovered this, or at least made it, I shouldn't say discovered it, lots of people I'm sure have noticed this, but he really investigated it and put it on the scientific map that um, rats really seem to be having a good time. And the way he did is he, he got um, ultrasonic microphones and recorded what rats were talking, you know, what rats were, what noises rats were making at various times. And he, there's not, there's not a language of course, but they certainly get very strong affective indicators of how they're feeling. And he noticed when they were having a good time, they squeaked in a certain way. And that when he, if he learned how to tickle them and he had to learn, uh, it's not just you know, patting them on the head, they don't like that. Um, but they, um, he learned how to tickle them and, um, and they would just come um, up to him to get tickled all the time. <laughs> they really enjoyed it. And they would make the same squeaks that he recorded when they were have it, you know, playing with each other. Uh, so um, this is, I, I think, fascinating that, um, so they do certainly have, you know, affective states of, of play and enjoyment. Uh, actually, in our experiments, we're, we're um, bringing in a, an ultrasonic microphone. It's not been done very often, and we're hoping to record brain activity while they're having a good time. Um, so, uh, so they certainly, you know, have pleasure, and, and of course we can observe them having pain. They'll they'll limp if uh, if they're 
hurt and they'll tend a wound. It's not just a question of a reaction. They will tend a wound and favor a leg that's been injured. Uh, interestingly, insects won't do that. So you can, you know, people have, people have done this, you can pull off legs of an insect uh, and um, it's, they, they don't show any behavioral change. Even bees who are quite, you know, considered among the smartest insects, uh, certainly they can navigate very effectively and communicate. They don't show any reaction to losing a few legs. Um, whereas uh, rats and, and mice will, uh, and many mammals will show a reaction. They'll, they'll you know, favor that leg, they'll avoid hurting it, you know, they'll avoid doing things that put it under stress. So it suggests that they really are experiencing some sort of something like pain or something that feeds back on their, on their plant and you know, on how they engage with the world. Um, <clears throat> if you want to be really subtle, uh, and this, this, uh, these, these figures are from a paper that was published just last year. So this is very recent. Um, this is a really nice example of the merger of machine learning and sympathetic uh, understanding of animals. Um, so two very different things. And that's, that's really where I want to work um, is that you can even, you know, it's hard to imagine, do mice make faces? Do they smile? Well, Actually, they do. And again, it was Jak Panksepp who really brought it to the attention of the scientific community. And again, I, there's a lot of things that pet owners know and you know, people who are sympathetic with animals know that have, have been sort of excluded from scientific discourse because they didn't you know, fit our philosophical preconceptions. Um, but, uh, but now with... Um, you know, with machine learning, we're able to, to really show that there are uh, consistent differences in the facial expressions. And you can sort of see them here. So if you compare, you know, a rat, uh, sorry, this is a mouse, a mouse who's, who's, you know, just sitting by himself, not doing very much with a rat who's, you know, had a, had a bit of pain. Uh, you, can, you can see there's quite a bit of difference there in the facial expression. And so the, the rat is, or the mouse is, is definitely making a grimace. Um, you know, scrunching his teeth. You can also see if they're tasting something that tastes bitter, they're making a face, like you would make a face. Ooh. Um, or if they're uh, drinking something that, that's sweet, that's quite well nice tasting, then they uh, will uh, have a, um, you know, their ears will perk up, uh, move forward a bit, and they, um, they seem a little bit more eager, you know, sort of they're bending forward, as opposed to, you know, this sort of, don't, don't, I don't want to put my mouth near there. Um, these, these pictures over here, these schematics are just highlighting where the computer can see the most differences between the face expression um, that the animal's exhibiting in the particular circumstance and the neutral face expression. Um, so it's just sort of a guide so you can look at those places. That's where you can see the differences. Um, and there's more subtle things. So these are you know, reactions to immediate experience. So if an animal's feeling nauseous, yeah, this kind of looks like, you know, if you look closely, this doesn't look like a, you know, this looks like a queasy animal, like sort of like you and I when we're queasy. Um, or if an animal's terrified um, and either running or trying to run for its life, or petrified and, and just still, then they have these very different fear face expressions. Uh, and uh, um, again, this is sort of an indicator that, you know, they're having something, some kind of experience, whether it's very deep or not, we, of course, we don't know. We, we, one of the things we're hoping to do is record the brain activity while they're having these experiences. The, this, these people, you know, uh, you know, this is quite novel just for recording this, the faces, but they didn't do any recordings of brain activity. So we're hoping to do that. But it shows us at least a range of feeling. And, you know, you remember Paul Ekman's, you know, six uh, emotions and the, the stereotypical faces. And there's a lot of reason to, to think that's much to meet and that human emotion is, is actually quite a bit more nuanced and varied than Ekman originally argued for, but there does, there is 
some sort of correlation between facial configurations and emotions. And it seems like we're seeing something like that here. So, um, so they, they have emotions, but what about um, social emotions and, and understanding? So we don't really know much about social emotions in rodents, except that they do show empathy. Uh, if another rat is in distress, uh, usually um, uh, a nearby rat will come and try to help. Um, I, I ran into this inadvertently when I was, you know, we had a number of very destructive squirrels in the backyard uh, of our house. So I trapped one of the squirrels in a live trap. Um, and then her brother came and uh, tried to open the trap <laughs> and spent, you know, took quite a bit of risk because <laughs> I could have been a fearsome predator <clears throat> to try to get uh, his sister out of the trap. Um, we knew they were brothers and sisters because they grown up as pups. Uh, in the tree in the backyard. And, and rats will do the same thing. And they'll even forego chocolate, which is one of their favorite foods, if there's one of their neighbor rats in distress. There's one exception, and that will not surprise many of you. So if two male rats have been fighting and are competitors, then, then and one of them is trapped, the other guy will just sit it out, have his chocolate, and enjoy the show. Uh, <laughs> they can be they can be nasty, unpleasant to each other. So, um, but I do want to talk about social understanding. Um, so macaque society is pretty strict. You, you sort of think of sort of our, our version of, of uh, sort of social fascism, you know. Uh, macaques beat each other up a fair bit. They'll, uh, they're kind of monkey. Um, and, um, you know, you don't cross the big guy. It's like the mafia, basically. Um, and uh, so um, what uh, two researchers, Robert Safarth and Dorothy Cheney did was they played a trick on the macaques. So they recorded um, the, you know, the, the vocalizations of, of different monkeys in a troop and they can all recognize each other's voices. Um, they, they know who is talking at any one time. And what they did was they, um, they switched roles. So they had so what they did was they spliced together recordings from, uh, let's say, a monkey who's usually low on the on the totem pole, uh, acting dominant. Of course, they took that recording from when that monkey was acting dominant to someone even lower, and they spliced that together with a high-ranking monkey who was acting or making submissive cries because that high he had been being chewed out by one by the big boss. So they spliced those recordings together. So you had a middle low ranking monkey and a middle high ranking monkey, but sort of role reversed. And uh, they played it to the members of the troop. They all knew who was talking. And when, you know, if they played them in the regular role, in the regular uh, roles where the, you know, the high ranking monkey was, you know, talking dominant and the low ranking monkey was talking submissive, the other monkeys didn't pay no, any attention. That was just normal business as usual. But if they roll reversed, if they had the high ranking monkey making submissive noises, everybody looked and stared and, and pricked up their ears and said, you know, as if they were saying, what the hell is going on here? Uh, something really strange has happened. So they do understand very much, you know, the normal social relationships, um, you know, in their somewhat fascist society. Okay, so we've talked about social understanding does that lead to communication and even to culture? And um, so Dr. Doolittle notwithstanding, we really can't find much of a grammatical pattern in uh, most of the calls uh, made by uh, other animals. It's not for want of trying. There's, you know, there are all these anecdotal reports of maybe a bit of grammatical signal in, in this monkey or in this dolphin, and then people try to replicate it and it doesn't seem to be there and we don't know, you know. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's very possible that there's only specific circumstances on which you see it. On the other hand, you know, if someone, rep it's also possible to delude oneself to, to see what you want to see. So the, the general pattern has been that we haven't seen We've seen hints of structure 
in the communication of some monkeys, uh, certainly of dolphins and of some birds, but we can't find a, it, it's hard to replicate what that structure is, hard to pin it down. And it certainly doesn't seem as complicated as language. So I think we have to kind of, at this point, pretty much, you know, drool out or at least put as very improbable the Dr. Doolittle hypothesis that they have, you know, animals have their own language. That being said, there is a good deal of specificity in, in um, monkey communication and in some bird communication. And it's not so much a representative language, you know, with grammar, but it's more a sort of prosody, like kind of like music. If you're trying to communicate something by music, if you're, you know, skilled with, with tones and, and, and melodies, you can, um, you know, communicate or in, you know, intimate something. Uh, and in specific contexts, that can be quite meaningful. So a lot of monkeys will you know, indicate by the, the, the prosody of their calls, if they're threatened by something, indicate, you know, is this an eagle or is this a snake or is this a leopard? Um, they'll have a specific kind of call for each, for each uh, uh, kind of threat. And of course the other monkeys know what to do. You know, if it's an eagle, you get down. If it's a leopard, you go up. Um, um, if it's a snake, you, <laughs> you just get away slowly or you mob it. Um, so they'll react in very uh, intelligent, uh, specific ways. Um, chimpanzees, are, now I think now we have something like 43, the last time I checked, distinct calls with apparently distinct meanings. And, um, you know, they, They'll, they'll certainly modulate their calls uh, oh, in, in the sort of way you might expect. So if something's big, there'll be a louder call. Um, and uh, so they, they can communicate sort of by, you know, a prosodic or uh, uh, analog means. There's some evidence for something that you might call signature calls. Some people think of them as names. I think that's maybe going a bit too far, uh, but some animals seem to announce themselves with a particular unique uh, variant of the species call. Do a lot of dolphins do this and some parrots seem to do this. And those are signature calls. And there's some evidence that they can even refer to others or call others by that. So in that, if that's true, then it might be a name. It might be functioning like a name. But that part has been hard to reproduce. Again, we do, we do it's pretty, pretty clear that they can identify, announce themselves by a particular uh, specific call. But um, you know, whether they can call each other is uh, still pretty, pretty dodgy, maybe. Um, and then um, someone on the chat referred to some sort of regional behaviors um, like bubble netting, which some whales do. And, and it's pretty clear that whales and um, dolphins have, have cultures, meaning that there are behaviors that are practiced in a particular part of the ocean um, that are not practiced by the same species in another part of the ocean. And people have been able to sort of monitor the spread of, let's say, the, um, the songs of uh, the humpback whales or the calls of the sperm whales um, that, um, you know, as they propagate, you know, as some males start singing a slight new variant of the song and either others ignore it or, or pick it up and propagate it and it can cross a whole ocean that way. Uh, so they, they certainly uh, have some, uh, so those, those mammals have some culture. Uh, they don't have hands, so they don't have sort of technological cultures. But um, you know, it's it's pretty clear that chimpanzees do have technological cultures. Um, so chimps in some areas crack nuts, and others don't crack nuts. And it's not because there are no nuts there. There are nuts there, and there are rocks. But they just somehow haven't picked up the knack of cracking nuts. And we can see that it takes a while to learn, and you need it. You need a model to do that. So it's it's something that might qualify as a kind of proto-culture. I'm not sure I want to call it a full culture, and there's a lot of debate about that. 
And Jane Goodall's discovery about fishing for termites, well, actually most chimps don't fish for termites, but her particular chimp subgroup did, and they passed it on. Um, I mentioned the, the spears, and that's just in one small group in Senegal. Um, we see something like this with birds. Um, it's a little bit unclear because we don't you know, have a, enough data yet, but it seems that different groups of crows, if you get them to use tools or if they use tools naturally, will have specific ways of handling the tools. They won't all do the same thing. And uh, so there may be some sort of tool use culture or at least motor culture among, among crows. Okay, let's um, switch gears a little bit um, and talk about the animals we see every day or that are closest to us. And um, I'm gonna disappoint a lot of you, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but our pets are not that bright. Uh, and uh, in fact, you know, we like to think dogs are, so, so first of all, dogs and cats do about equally well on problem solving tasks. Um, we, um, so let, I'm not going to get into the dog and cat wars, but, um, dogs don't do very well at solving problems on their own. Uh, wolves do quite a bit better than dogs. If you give them the same kind of task, like opening, you know, something that's inside of a container or, um, you know, figuring out how to open a latch to get, you know, into some food on the other side of a fence. Uh, wolves will generally do better at those kind of tasks than dogs will. Um, however, if a dog has a problem, <laughs> it's very good at soliciting human beings to help it solve the problem. And wolves don't do that. Uh, and dogs are also very attentive to human communication. So dogs are one of the few animals you can um, indicate to something to by pointing. So if if you, you know, if, if you know there's, you know, if there's, if there's two places that food might be and the experimenter points to one of those places, uh, a dog will go to that place generally. Most dogs will go to that place. Uh, wolves will typically not. Wolves will pick either place equally likely. They'll ignore what you're pointing. Interestingly, chimps will by and large ignore. Not always. Some chimps can learn what that means, but most of them, they don't use pointing as a gesture. Um, much of them themselves, so they, they, don't, they don't pick it up easily. They can learn it. Uh, some, chimps, some chimps have learned it, but they don't, it's not natural for them. Uh, so generally chimps will go for either of the places with equal probability and ignore that you are looking at or pointing to a particular container with, with the food in it. Um, so dogs um, are the exception in the animal world. They will They'll, they understand reference. So if you're looking at something, they're more likely to look there. If you're pointing at something, they're much more likely to go there. Um, and of course, we couldn't train dogs if they didn't do that. So they're much better at interacting with us, and we think they're more intelligent because they do that. Uh, but actually, they're not very bright on their own. And, and there's, I think, a deep lesson there for, for us. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, if you give cats uh, this sort of standard animal puzzle solving tasks, you know, getting into a container. Um, you know, they, they do as well as dogs, which is to say not particularly well. <laughs> um, they don't pay very much attention to our communicative signals. They'll know when we're angry, but only if it affects them. Uh, uh, and they'll, they'll understand if we're grieving, but they uh, generally don't pay much attention to our, our you know, our indications of reference or our, they don't care where we're looking. Um, so with the exception of those of, of you who are cat lovers, you know, I think it's fair to say most people perceive cats as less intelligent, but that's actually not true. Um, now there, um, what about our other domestic animals? Generally speaking, most domestic animals are considerably less intelligent than their wild counterparts. Uh, so domestic sheep, you know, get themselves caught in fences. Generally speaking, wild sheep don't. Um, and, um, you know, domestic animals of every type, domestic cows are considerably less clever than, than um, 
their ancestors, the Aurochs. Um, but there's sort of one famous exception, which I think sheds some light on the general question of animal intelligence and why I think animal intelligence has been in bad odor and has been sort of banished from science for most of the 20th century. And that was a particular horse named Clever Hans. Um, and uh, he was famous for uh, answering questions from the public by tapping his hoof. And he, you know, of course, the easiest thing was arithmetic questions. Uh, but he could also answer geography questions. It, he was really amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, of course, this was quite, quite astonishing. And a number of uh, investigators, you know, thought, of course, this has got to be a trick. Um, you know, there's some sort of signaling going on and, and this has got to be a trick. But nobody could find the trick uh, for several years until Oscar Funkst um, was brought in. He studied Hans uh, and noticed that his trainer, and you can see the trainer, I think in this picture right here, so his owner, trainer, um, he wears a very, uh, a very distinctive hat with a very broad brim. And the trainer was, you know, or the, the owner was very invested in Clever Hans. And Clever Hans was apparently very, um, very attentive to his owner. So uh, when, you know, as the question was, you know, after the question had been asked, Hans would start tapping his foot and the owner would, would you know, look expectantly and then, you know, raise his, his, um, his hat, you know, his, he'd be sitting, you know, standing sort of on tippy toe as it were, and his, um, his hat, the brim of his hat would be rising. And then when Hans had got the correct number, if it's an arithmetic problem, the, the owner would, would sort of relax and have a, you know, a, like heaving a sigh of relief. And uh, the hat would go down very slightly. And so Hans would stop. And um, it's amazing how, how much, you know, how clever he could seem just by watching social cues. And I think that, you know, uh, that's, it's unfortunate that that put off, you know, a century, almost a century of, of psychologists from taking animal intelligence seriously. But uh, it does, I think, uh, provide a cautionary tale about how we should test animal intelligence. And one of the, you know, the key issues is you don't want to have uh, any way of cueing the animal as to what the right answer is in terms that the animal would understand. Um, I think we could say something about how uh, we set tests for undergraduate students along the same vein, but I'll wait for, <laughs> for another opportunity for that. Okay, now let's think about animals that are really alien, really different from us. And here we're on much shakier ground for a variety of reasons. Um, we will talk about just two animals, fish, um, and both of these animals show extraordinary motor planning and execution skills, um, things that we would have a hard time doing. And, um, and yet it's not clear that they really have, you know, general intelligence. They seem to have very specific intelligences. Uh, so archer fish are famous for the way that they uh, shoot down insects, uh, insects who are, uh, they live in streams in Southeast Asia or so mangrove swamps in Southeast Asia and streams and they shoot, um, excuse me, at the insects that are, you know, clinging to, to leaves or twigs that are hanging over the water. So they have good eyes. Uh, they're very accurate. What's really astonishing is that, you know, they, they can be accurate from a variety of different positions. They don't need to get into a sweet spot. They can shoot from several meters away and hit an insect, or they can sh shoot from right underneath. But what's really interesting is, especially when they shoot from far away, of course, um, insects don't sort of just drop straight down. They tumble. Um, often they're, they're, they're trying to escape, so they fly in some sort of random way. But they're, 
they're a little bit shocked, so they don't fly very effectively, but they will tumble in some sort of random way. And what's really interesting is that the archer fish is ready to meet them when they hit the water. Uh, so as soon as the insect starts falling, the archer fish makes a beeline for where the insect is gonna land. And he's, again, they're very accurate about this. And what's really astonishing is that if there are two archer fish in the same area and one shoots, both of them will head for the same spot. So they can both figure out where the insect's gonna land, even though the insect you know, may have gone to the left or the right or forward or back uh, from the twig. They're not, they don't drop straight down. Um, so this is an astonishing feat of, of sort of motor anticipation, you know, of, of anticipation. We have no idea how they do it, but um, it's, it's quite impressive. Um, uh, I'll be, I won't be talking about this on Saturday. I'm giving a talk um, at the MSU Science Festival on uh, the dynamics of the brain. And I'll, but I will be showing some videos of fish brains, not this fish brain, but I'm, uh, a different kind of fish brain in action. Um, and then, of course, uh, someone raised the, was that Steve or was that somebody else raised the question of, of octopus? Um, and the octopods, they have probably the largest brains of invertebrates that we know of, uh, about half a billion neurons. So a little bit bigger, a, a little bit more of a brain than your dog has. Um, and they show very shrewd behavior in the wild. So here uh, is an octopus on the left, um, you know, who's feeling a little vulnerable. They're very soft bodied, of course. Uh, sharks eat them all the time. So they really wanna stay out of the way of sharks and other predatory fish. So um, what they'll do is often hide and um, one thing they like to do is sort of make jury rig a shelter, a hard uh, shelter out of other animals' shells. And so here um, he's using a scallop shell, but also the octopus, she's also using a, um, a uh, half of a coconut um, that has been cut by people at some point in the past, half of a coconut shell, and um, making quite a nice uh, sort of trapdoor escape pod. Um, so the, you know, they're able to at least anticipate, uh, you know, the situations they might be in and they have astonishing motor skills. So they on the right, there's a couple of stills from a video. This is, you can find this on YouTube where the, uh, octopus is opening a, a, uh, jar with a screw top. Um, and you can even find videos where they're where the octopus has been put inside the jar with the screw top and they're opening it to get out. Um, so it's quite, uh, they're quite dexterous. Um, as I said, we've only in the last year been able to even to record one neuron from out of the half a billion in the brain of an octopus. And it's, we really have no idea what's going on in their heads. Um, but their general problem solving skills don't, you know, they, they don't seem to have any abstract problem solving skills. Um, so to get back to the issue of, you know, whether sociability is important, um, maybe it is. Um, they do have, you know, if you think about manual dexterity, remember that actually they have nine brains. Uh, they have one brain, a small brain, and, and I don't mean it's just like a nerve ganglion, this is like, um, on the order of 30 million, 30 or 40 million neurons in this, um, you know, in the root of each of the arms. They've got their, you know, that's, that's a sizable brain, quite a bit bigger than most insect brains. And then their main brain, of course, is around their, their mouth. And that has uh, about 200 million neurons. And uh, um, so most of the neurons are actually in their arms, more than half are in the arms. And they are somewhat independent. The bandwidth, the connect. So one thing we can say is that the connections between the main brain and the mini brains in the arms are quite low bandwidth. There's about 5,000 axons between them, which uh, you know, 5,000 axons is you know about what what I use to move my little finger here. Um, and that's so that's really not very high, you know, 
high bandwidth. So it seems, as far as we can tell, and you know, this is getting to skating on thin ice, as far as we can tell, these most of the time, these eight mini brains have a fair bit of autonomy and they're sort of very loosely coordinated by the master brain. And it's only under specific circumstances, like when the octopus really needs to coordinate uh, uh, very effectively when fleeing a predator or something that, that the master brain sort of seizes control uh, of all of them. So an octopus is somewhere in between you know, a creature and a sort of community, uh, as far as we can tell. There are a few weird examples of cre other creatures like that, but not very many. Okay, so um, I hope I've perhaps convinced you of two things. First of all, that animals are not machines. They're not little robots or wind-up toys. But I also hope that I've at least provided some skepticism about the idea that they're just like us, except that they're, you know, trapped in, they can't speak and they're trapped in their, their mute furry bodies. Um, they seem to have different kinds of minds and different kinds of intelligences. Um, and uh, I don't think we should expect to communicate with any of them uh, really on a deep level. They're, they're, I may be surprised, um, but they seem to be very much here and now, at least with us. And, and if this changes, it would be wonderful. Uh, and, and I won't rule it out absolutely, but I think as far as we can tell, we're, we're not going to expect to be able to, you know, have a conversation with a lion or have a conversation even with, um, you know, a monkey. Um, so, or, you know, I'm not sure about dolphins. Maybe not. But I think that animal minds do have a good deal of, you know, implication for humanism, especially humanism as we sort of evolve into the 21st century. And I think, I hope I've convinced you that rather than yes or no, the answer should be, you know, how much and what kind of minds do they have, um, that it's more of a continuum. Um, and I, I would like to suggest that, you know, we do owe some animals some duty of care and we should, you know, we, we shouldn't treat them um, you know, as if they're unfeeling brutes, because many of them do have really fairly sophisticated emotional lives, uh, even if you know we don't know how sophisticated their how nuanced their combination of emotion and cognition is. That's something that I, I think is is a has been taken to an extreme in the human mind, um, and I, I've done a talk on human brain evolution that um, goes into that in some more detail. But um, I think we can both shed light on our own minds, but also sort of ground our own kinds of mental processes and experiences in the, the broader, see, in the broader community of other minds, of, of other animals, and feel part of the broader spectrum of life. And I hope that'll stand us in good stead when we really do encounter an advanced civilization, if we ever do. Uh, okay, I'd like to leave you with uh, just some uh, readings and some thoughts if um, you're interested in animal intelligence. Um, you know, Franz Duval is sort of the, the doyen of, of, you know, animal abilities. Um, again, uh, you shouldn't take any of these people as the absolute truth. A lot of animal behaviorists think that Franz goes somewhat overboard. But remember, he's he was, you know, trained at a time when people dismissed animal intelligence. He was one of the first people to really document the subtlety of the political struggles and emotional lives of great apes. So he, you know, he deserves a bit of slack. Um, if you want a book that covers a wide variety of animals, uh, look at Virginia Morell. Uh, actually, this is where I first encountered Archer Fish. Um, she covers 11 different species of animal, all the way from ants through archer fish to, to apes, and talks about their different capacities. So that'll give you a, a view of the, the variability. 
Uh, she's a bit short on, you know, she, she's, she's strong on the gee whiz and, and oh my, look at what they can do, and a bit short on the what does it mean um, and how are they doing it. Uh, if you want a pretty serious neuroscience book that's very well written for the pop, you know, for the intelligent layperson, I really recommend Robert Sapolsky's book, and he does cover a lot about animal behavior sort of in passing. Uh, he's mostly interested in human behavior, but he illustrates it with a lot of his work in Africa on macaques. Um, if you want a, a recent book that's very philosophical, uh, I'm just reading this now. I'm really recommending it to people. Um, it's, it's not an easy read, um, but it's, it's a much better kind of neurophilosophy than I think we've used to. It's very nuanced looking at the range and the spectrum of different kinds of consciousness and minds in all the way from, you know, from uh, crustaceans, from lobsters, up through octopods, up through, you know, through and then back to, you know, on the other branch of the tree of life from fish through um, uh, met rodents, th um, through apes, through to people, and uh, some some excursions into other animals. So I think it's a very it's one of the best books um, on some of these topics I've read, but it's very abstract. It's very philosophical. Um, if you're into videos, I saw someone put put in the chat already. This is just a just a very deep and touching encounter between a human being uh, as a diver and um, an octopus and they, how they share a year of their lives together and how he understands her life better and, um, and her stresses and how they, they share something. They seem to communicate in a way that is, is amazing and mesmerizing and, and you know, makes me wonder what might be possible. Um, you know, again, for a short-lived creature who's really had no social experience, um, somehow they seem to be communicating, but again, it's it's hard to know exactly what's going on. Uh, and then if you really want to get to dive into the amazing capabilities of bird intelligence, um, some of, again, Nicole, uh, Nicola Clayton's work and others, a lot of this has been done in England. Um, the Nova special on called Bird Brain is, is a good source for that. And with that, I will um, wrap up and we can take some questions and discussion. Boy, the chat has been booming. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's go back. Uh, I think Chris Wu has a hand up. So why don't Chris, you talk <coughs> first and then we can go to some of the chat questions. Okay, great. Thank you. This is a great presentation. Um, so a couple of quick questions. One is, um, I don't know, you have done it at the beginning of the presentation. Is there a definition of the different stratifications or level of intelligence? So for example, uh, we know that things like rhesus monkeys, chimps, elephants, uh, dolphins, and uh, magpies, right? They can have some kind of self-awareness, they can recognize themselves in mirrors. Does that play them? at a different level in terms of, you know, defining intelligence than the other animals. And two is, um, you were talking about the the languages, right? Or not language, very strong word, but the sequential sounds mm -hmm. that that we have recorded from the whales and also the, the communication between dolphins and orcas, like uh, before there are many different maneuvers they're repeatable, they seem to be the same. Uh, are there, is it foreseeable, especially with our computing power that when we get a tremendous amount of these recordings that we can sequence them into like recognizable patterns and that potentially one day there could be some kind of like a Google translator between well, that's, that's very, us and them. That was, that's very tempting. Uh, um, I, I would, I'd love to see that. In fact, there is, a woman uh, researcher in the Caribbean who's work, who works in the Caribbean, who is trying that right now, who's actually making recordings of, I'm trying to remember, I think, I think she works with dolphins rather than whales. I could be, there's, a, there's actually another group that does try to play back recordings from whales, but they're not doing it very systematically. She's trying to um, sort of understand and 
you know, if there's any creature with, with referential language, I think dolphins are probably one of the best bets. But uh, so she's trying to do this. I think it's worthy, but she doesn't have very good evidence yet that it's working. Um, I really hope she succeeds. It would be wonderful if she succeeds, but I, I wouldn't hold my breath and I wouldn't bet on it. I mean, uh, you know, there was a, a famous, um, you know, a couple of experiments in the 60s where this guy tried to communicate with dolphins and, and then, you know, it was very new agey and he got on, you know, in the magazine covers and, and, and then it turned out to be almost all, you know, almost all sort of over-interpretation of the data. Nobody could replicate it. Uh, so, you know, I, I'd love to see it, but I think it's a long shot. Um, I'm just gonna briefly answer your first question. There's a lot of other things in the chat to address and we're running a little short on time, but um, you know, basically in terms of tests of animal intelligence, of course, we, if you really believe that there are different kinds of intelligences, it's not clear that there's gonna be a scale like an IQ, but there, you know, we typically give animals sort of cognitive problem solving tests where they you know, have to you know, open, get at something that's hidden, uh, find something that's not obvious, and there's a variety of these tests, and, and there has been some attempt to give the same kind of test across a number of different animals uh, to see how different animals do. And yes, there may be a rough ranking, but it's also clear that some animals are very good at solving certain kinds of problems and not very good at all at solving other kinds of problems that look to us to be equally hard. But that's from our point of view. You know, We've evolved a certain way of approaching problems, so certain kinds of problems look about equally hard to us, but animals with different kinds of minds may find some of these much harder than others. And of course, we see that variation in human beings. Um, you know, there's some people who can effortlessly memorize, you know, the periodic table and all of the other things, but they have trouble remembering where their socks are. Um, I'm one of those people, by the way. So uh, you, can, you can laugh at me. My, my spouse finds it just hilarious. Uh, and, uh, you know, other people who are very good at reading a room and can, you know, can change everybody's mind in five minutes, but who, you know, who, who can't think very clearly about or, or, or systematically. So there's a variety of kinds of intelligences. And um, so I think we should not expect there to be a single scale of, of intelligence. Um, okay, I'm going to answer a few questions in the chat. Um, so, Rocco Bay, Rocco Day, I'm sorry, Mike, I should put on my glasses like a person should. Um, the, um, sorry, Rocco Bay, uh, I think I mentioned kindness um, and perhaps spitefulness. Um, uh, there's certainly, you know, evidence among apes, um, you know, the two apes have had a fight. Um, sometimes they'll reconcile. Uh, and often the, 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 the elderly, the older females will try to get them to reconcile. Very occasionally, um, one of them will make a motion to reconcile. And then when the other approaches, they'll, uh, she'll give her a really hard bite. <laughs> and uh, so they, that's certainly a deception and a certain a kind of spitefulness. Um, but uh, um, so there, there's certainly, I think, evidence for those things. Um, okay. Um, do you mean they're not, Rocco Bay asked, do you mean they're not bright yet or that they'll never be, be able to develop greater intelligence? Um, that's, I, I, I would hesitate to say never <laughs> about anything. Um, generally speaking, in evolutionary terms, when one kind of animal occupies a niche it, it competitively excludes all the other animals. Uh, I think we've kind of occupied the technological intelligence niche for this planet. Um, I'd be very surprised if any other animal evolves to, uh, in, to a technical intelligence while we're occupying that niche. Um, whether we will genetically modify other animals to do so, I, I don't know. Um, so, uh, someone saying a cat can follow pointing a finger. Um, I've, you know, I, I've never seen that actually, you know, that they can actually, you know, if you point at something, they'll go and, 
and and get to the particular place. Uh, if if you can show me a video of that, I'll 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 believe it. But I don't think it's very common. Um, your cat will play fetch. That's unusual. I've heard of that before, um, but I don't think very many cats do that. Um, much, yeah, someone's commenting, much individual difference between cats. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, oh, how do clever hunts do geography? Yeah, someone has to know the answer. And, and it, it was pretty clear that, that it was only when the, when the trainer or somebody he was watching knew the answer that he, that Clever Hans could could do that, and he would, you know, tap uh, tap out the letters, you know, tap out numbers corresponding to the letters of the alphabet. Uh, that's how he would do that. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know this. Um, oh, yeah, I have heard of this dog bunny. Um, so there's a few dogs that can do some some amazing communication. Um, I think a lot of them are, uh, I think, what, Australian retrievers or something. Um, and uh, I, 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 to my knowledge, nobody has done any kind of brain scans of those animals. So we don't, I don't know anything about how their brains work. It's, it's suggestive that they can, you know, under, under unusual circumstances, learn something about the meaning, you know, about association of between words and, um, and objects. Um, and um, I think you've heard of Alex the gray parrot who could also do that. But it, it doesn't seem to be easy. It, there aren't many animals who could seem to learn this. There's some sort of individual difference about these animals that makes it very, very compelling. So, you know, Irene Pepperberg, who trained Alex has been training several other parrots, but they they're nowhere near Alex in terms of their abilities, even though they were selected to be, you know, uh, pretty intelligent. Um, and then, yeah, so someone's mentioning Alex the Gray Parrot. Um, yeah, that's a nice book. I mean, I think um, Irene Pepperberg deserves a great deal of credit for pursuing something that everyone told her would would be a failure, but that she, you know, she you know had reason to think would be true and overcoming. I think you know she had a hard time overcoming skepticism. Um, I, I my own opinion is you know she's been so used to to you know going against the scientific consensus for so long, she may not you know be taking some of the critiques that are worth taking. Um, I've met her. I, I think she's you know definitely a, a pioneer in animal intelligence, but like many pioneers, she's not necessarily aware of the weaknesses of her own position. Um, uh, aren't we basing our other animals' intelligence on the human definition of intelligence? Well, yes, <laughs> I guess we're mostly giving them problem-solving tasks because those are things we can reproduce. In terms of emotional intelligence, I don't think there's really very many good uh, you know, tests of that or good measures of that. And again, there's quite a bit of variability. Um, and then Tris is asking, are the pet studies based on animals? Yeah, they're almost, yeah, the ones that get published are based on a lab setting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it is, it seems to be true, or at least I, I believe it's true that, that when they're in their home environment, they're, they may be much more, they may have more capabilities. Um, how do you test, how do you bring that out in a controlled situation? That's very hard because you, in an experiment, you wanna be testing just one thing. You wanna keep everything else constant. And of course, if you go to somebody's home, the animal, you know, the, there's the smells on objects, there's habits, the animals, the smells on the ground, lots of things that are somewhat invisible to us that animals can use as cues. So are you testing that they know the name of an object or are you testing that they associate this name with a particular route or a particular color or a particular smell. It's very hard to, to devise a test you can do in someone's home that is um, you know, really yeah. a, a, a very critical test of the thing you're testing. Can um, I just jump in on my comment? Sure, please do. It's Tris. Um, 
Yeah, it's interesting because my cat will initiate play and mm -hmm. she will literally bring the toy and I will ask her, do you want your mouse or your ball? And she knows the difference between the two and she will bring what I ask her. And then she will tap on my foot a couple of times and then we'll start playing fetch. So she also knows about right now, she's very young, but she knows about seven words too, which is mm -hmm. Interesting. So that's why I was asking about the lab versus the home. Thank you. I think that's a fair question, Tris. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's a, a fair critique of these studies to say that animals are probably defensive and nervous in the lab. But it's also fair to say that at home they've got a lot more cues other than the, the things you notice that you think that they're using. Uh, so there's, most animals have a much better sense of smell than we do. Um, and of course, you know, if you've spent any time on all fours, you know that the world looks very different um, from that perspective. Um, most animals have better hearing. Um, and they, so, so the kind of cues they might be using, um, you know, may not be obvious to us. So we, you know, you think they're doing one thing, but they may be doing it not the way you think that they're doing. And um, so that's why we bring in animals into the lab. But of course, that's an impoverished environment and one that places most pets under kind of stress. So they don't perform as well. They, they shut down. So I, I think both, you know, uh, both critiques. Now, if we could, you know, if someone would allow their home to be invaded for, you know, and, and fiddled with for several weeks, we might, you know, or months, we might get down to it. But that's, that's asking a lot. Okay, I think why well, there's messages still coming in. Um, uh, thanks for uh, for your comments. Um, lots more we could say. I think we're kind of running out of time, um, and uh, I'm. I also have some other work that I need to do tonight, so I think I'll probably have to to, to log off. But um, thanks for your attention, and um, I hope I'll be uh, be back for this group at some point in the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Reimers, and uh, we'll certainly ask ask you to come back. Uh, I'll be posting this video in a couple of days on our YouTube channel, and uh, so you'll be able to tell your friends about it in case they missed it. Great. Well, Thank you. I'm glad to have the chance to do so. I hope I'll be back uh, with you guys soon, and hopefully at some point in person. Um, <laughs> I'll be... Uh, probably I'll probably be coming through uh, Boston at some point, but I think we can keep doing this. It's it's much cheaper than <laughs> me flying to Boston, but I I, am, I have this you know I have business that takes me through Boston occasionally when when the world is back to relatively normal. Well, um, I hope everybody has a, celebrates Earth Day. It's coming up. Oh, remind me which I I will, uh, what day of the what well, day it's of April twenty second? But there's EarthDay.org because of the COVID. I mean there aren't really any major celebrations, but uh, I think as humanists, I think it's pretty important. Important yeah. day really to. Yeah, that's one of our festival days, I think. Sure. Um, good, and a couple of you made suggestions. Um, I'll have to look up about this uh, book, Forest Bathing with Your Dog. Um, oh yeah, I, I did mention Irene Pepperberg's uh, work with Alex. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, sorry, I have to go. I, I, do, um, <laughs> I do enjoy talking with this group. You're very engaged. You're, you're one of the most engaged groups I talk with. So frankly, I enjoy this group a great deal and I hope I'll get to meet you in person at some time in the not too distant future again. That'd so, be great. Thanks again, care. everybody, and good night. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.